talking to you. Okay, so I'm going to dive right in. Thank you for uh, coming to my talk. I know you have a wonderful selection of accessibility talks in this time slot. So clearly this is the one that still has to be available. Um, I have, uh, if you follow me on Twitter at all, I'm sorry, but um, I noted that I had a, 108 slides in 40 minutes, and after a lot of work, I've gotten it down to 120 slides. So we're going to see how many of those I get through. To manage your expectations, all of my slides will be available online later. Um, that's Roselli, R-O-S-E-L dot L-I slash W-C-L-D-N. Um, and I'm saying this now partly because uh, as I manage my own, mismanage my own time, I have a whole chunk of slides that I'm just going to fly through because they're mostly technical stuff. And the nice thing about technical stuff is it's so boring that you guys can read it on your own time. And when you fall asleep, I won't be personally hurt or emotionally traumatized. I really thought you were coming to pull me off the stage. <laughs> Such an auspicious start. Um, uh, quick question. How many people here use WordPress for uh, CMS or a blog platform? That's good. Okay. Most of you. How many of you use, in addition to WordPress, some other platform besides WordPress as a blog or CMS platform? Okay. Usually I see a much higher ratio. Uh, part of the reason I always ask that question is because I'm going to be talking to you about things that apply regardless of the platform. There is a chunk in here about WordPress, but I'm going to be talking a little bit broader than that. So, uh, really quick, this slide is dedicated to my ego. Yay. Uh, I have a website. I only put it here because I write on accessibility pretty regularly. So, adrianrizzoli.com. And then you can avoid me on Twitter at Ardrian. That's A-A-R-D-R-I-A-N. I recommend you. Um, I'm here because the Pazzello group was able to pay for me to come here, otherwise I couldn't afford to fly across the ocean to tell you all these lovely, wonderful things. So, uh, right off the bat, some of you have probably seen the A11Y hashtag or seen it used, maybe not on Twitter or elsewhere. And it's not uncommon for people to say, what is that? What is Ali? Who is Ali? What does Ali mean? So, real quick, accessibility. A111Y needs accessibility. It's just a numeronym. It's a, it's a pretty common uh, technique in some communities where you just remove all the middle letters and you replace it with the count of characters that were cut. So localization is L10N, internationalization is I18N. When you see A11Y or A11Y or Alley, it means accessibility in almost all those cases. Um, the thing about accessibility, though, as I've discovered over the years, is that it typically gets no respect. Uh, it's sort of an afterthought, it's a thing people aren't really too interested in. When, um, when I had my own company, we were painting the offices, we were going through colors to paint everything. And that nice blue is called online blue, line repeat, I don't know why they call it that. The ceiling was cyberspace gray, you know, real high tech sounding, sounding terms. Oh yeah, we, we moved out. Um, but accessible beige. <laughs> So the color of computers, for, you know, I, old IBM computers from the 1980s, that was the color that my partners wanted to paint my office because I did the accessibility stuff and they thought, accessible beige. Bunch of jerks. <laughs> so these are the things we're going to run through. Um, some statistics just to give you a little bit of grounding. I'm going to fly through those though. I'm going to talk about this whole concept of being selfish. The technical bits is probably the part I'm going to skip the most, just so you know. So statistics, right off, these are US, this particular slide is US focused. Um, because if you haven't figured out by my accent, yes, I'm from the United States. I don't know if that was obvious, I'll just keep talking. So in the US, um, any disability, when we look at the numbers for who has any type of disability, which includes visual, hearing, mobility, cognitive, we're looking at in that age range of 21 to 64, 10% of the population. You'll note that at this 75 and up age, it hits 50%. Sort of a, a theme that happens. Uh, worldwide, 285 million people have some sort of uh, vision impairment. And 82% uh, of those people living with blindness are 50 and above. There's a bit of an age factor there as well as we see from some of these other stats. 
Hearing impairments affect 360 million people worldwide. That's disabling hearing loss. That means that they really do need help to get by in, say, uh, an event like this, where you're socializing with a room full of other people who are also socializing, all of whom have more interesting things to say. Um, so 36 million American, adult, uh, American adults report some degree of hearing loss. Uh, mobility impairments, relatively low as you're younger, but they tend to increase. So 5.5% in the 21 to 64 year old age bracket in the US goes up to a third of the population that are 75 and older. Uh, cognitive impairments are always a little bit trickier for people to sort of get their arms around. It, it includes, this is just some of them, dyslexia, dyscalculia, which is the numbers version of dyslexia, to simplify it, um, memory issues, distractions, the, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, in, in the US, that number is about 4.3% of the population in my age bracket, and then again continues to climb. But one thing I've learned is that showing the stats doesn't really make the case. I show the stats because I want people to understand, first and foremost, this is a real population of people. If you're more like me, you don't care. Screw them, I really don't care. My whole treatise is about being selfish. So that's what I'm here to talk to you about. If you were in Heather Burns' talk earlier today, you might have seen this uh, pyramid. And if you weren't, cool, now you get to see it again for the first time, I guess. So WebAIM is an organization called Web Accessibility in Mind. And they have this hierarchy to, that they see as motivating accessibility change. And when you start off by guilting people, you're, you're not going to be as effective. Punishment it means that they've already done something. And, that just creates a bad, bad relationship afterward. You make it a requirement, they'll do it, but they're not necessarily so interested. If you start to reward people, then they you know, start to, to pick it up a little bit more. You wanna work to get them enlightened, and, and ultimately you want them to be inspired. You want them to just know that it's the right thing to do and feel that it's something that sets them apart and the product. I, again, am wired very selfishly, so I modified it. I put a star on top of this tree. <laughs> And it's all about making it about me. So you might have been in some talks already, you've heard people talking about the users, not this guy. So to run through some of these things, getting older affects nearly everybody, um, except those who are fortunate enough to not have to get older, I should really rethink that. So um, it does carry risks and side effects, as I note, and it's definitely not for the young, as evidenced by how few young people are old. <laughs> The only thing separating these two couples, uh, besides about four feet, is, is probably 30, 40 years. But really, they're, they're doing the same thing. They're living the same life. They're both arguing about probably where they're gonna go get some food next. I don't know for sure. The only thing separating these two women, besides uh, the fact that one of them is using a solar-powered piece of technology, is probably about 40 years again. They're doing the same thing. They're, they're, they're hanging out, they're reading. Well, she might be tweeting, I don't know. But conceptually, they're doing the same thing. The only difference for them is age. Really not that different. Um, accidents happen to people, a lot. Um, I am evidence of that. I could show you the, the row of scars across my head and all the other things I've broken over the years, but then it gets kind of weird and I might be in violation of the code of conduct. So um, accidents come in the form of everything like broken limbs, eye injuries, hearing injuries, head trauma, et cetera. Uh, if you've ever broken a wrist and tried to use a computer, you, you realize how quickly, you, rather you quickly realize how difficult it is to do things like operate the mouse, use the keyboard, close the lid, um, actually click save instead of reply at the wrong time. Um, sometimes just uh, having a temporary vision me problem means that you, uh, you lose your depth perception and instead of grabbing the mouse, you end up pushing it off the table. Hilarious. Uh, and now that they're all wireless, now you have to go hunting for it. You can't just reel it in. <laughs> some people do it as a fashion choice, okay. Um, some people arguably m might start an activity with a cognitive issue, but they definitely end with more issues. This, this, th that wheel of cheese that they're chasing down a hill, by the way, is a tradition somewhere in this country. You all should know better than I, I hope, because I forgot. Um, anyway, what's interesting about this is at the bottom of the hill, they have a team of ambulances waiting. <laughs> it's not a function of if somebody gets hurt. 
after every one of these, somebody walks away temporarily disabled. Maybe permanently, depending on whether or not they got the cheese. Um, <laughs> if, like me, you believe that you are invincible and allergic to nothing, then there are other things you have to bear in mind. Multitasking, sunlight can be a great weakness. Eating at your desk, not having headphones handy, just not even working in your native language. And um, I thought my native language was English until I came here, so that's awkward. Uh, but this, this is how I spend a lot of my days. Uh, I try not to get a taco filling bits into my keyboard because it's a laptop and you can't just shake it, it's very bad. Um, I like to sit on my patio or on my porch and if you've ever used a phone in the sun or tried to work in the sun, it's really difficult. You're turning the brightness all the way up and then how long does your battery last? Oh, it already ran out. Uh, these guys I think are professionals. <laughs> I would like to point out, though, that neither of them has a free hand to actually use the computer. <laughs> but they brought the tarp. I mean, these guys are on top of it. But this, this is a function of they're not just in the sun, they're distracted. They're doing other things. And if by chance they had to use email or, or fill out an online application or sign up for a bank account, you know nine times out of ten they're doing it wrong every keystroke. Uh, this guy's my favorite, though. I would like to point out, part of the reason he's my favorite is because his laptop is a typewriter. <laughs> Solar powered, baby. Uh, sometimes you find that you're working in a public space because it's the only option you have. I can tell you the Airbnb flat that I have right now is a little too small. So I will probably be working in cafes for the next few days. Um, this is a case where the headphones become really important. He's doing video work. It's very hard to do video work when there's a lot of background noise because, well, you can't hear anything and maybe you don't want everybody to hear what you're up to anyway. Also the consideration of having a significant other in bed with you. I work in bed. I don't know that I would want to wake up a dog that big because I'm watching a video or, or dictating something or just shouting at my computer because the error messages are so arcane. This photo is kind of analogous to my, uh, how I live. I don't live in apartments, but I do live somewhere where I am flanked by motorcycles. And on the weekends, these guys like to have motorcycle duels. They want to show whose motorcycle is loudier, louder and throatier. And if I am trying to do any work, that's very much a problem. It also explains why I have closed captions on my television permanently. I never know when they're going to start it up, and it's usually during like the critical scene of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Um, I have been this person in a foreign country trying to look up information about the flight that might have been canceled on a keyboard that has characters I don't recognize, looking at a website that is localized for the region I'm in as opposed to the language I speak. And all of a sudden, I feel like I have a cognitive disability because I don't know what I'm looking at. It makes no sense to me. This happens more often than I think people are, are, are really willing to admit. And if you, uh, from my experience, just bouncing around Europe and Southeast Asia, when I go into any place that has these public terminals, there are a lot of really confused people sitting at them. They're not locals, they're just confused. Uh, another thing to consider, though, is that uh, if you're in this room, you'll probably have some comfort level with technology, which means that when it comes to family events, the holidays, uh, you might be tech support. That sucks. I don't like going to my parents' house and changing printer paper and printer cartridges and updating all the, 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 uh, the software on their machine and you know doing all the Windows checks and reboots galore. I, I just want to eat the turkey. It's a simple goal. So. If, you, if you're in a situation where you're always helping other people, you might start to recognize that if the interfaces were a little bit easier, maybe you wouldn't have to spend so much of that time. You could eat turkey. If turkey's a thing here, not so much. I'm... Yeah, that's, that's why we left. <laughs> anyway, so... Um, Still gonna stick sort of high level here. I'm gonna talk a little bit about user experience models. I've, I've given you sort of the, the context for Selfish and I'm gonna pull it into user stories. Um, not gonna spend too much time on this, but it was uh, sort of a, is anybody here not familiar with user stories? This is awesome. I don't have to spend 14 minutes on this slide. That's this thing. So I have these really simple user stories that are based on this Selfish model. 
And let me give you a little bit of context as you're reading that anyway. Um, I have found that when I put together personas and user stories for clients, they often don't understand who that accessible persona is. They're not necessarily invested in it or interested in it. All it does is represent extra work they're going to have to do. And in many organizations, when they are looking at how many personas they have, they're saying, we need to get down to three or four, maybe five on the high end. Who do you think is the first persona to get cut? Jerry, the guy in the wheelchair. Lucy, the one who can't see. Those gone every time. So I have started to fold these selfish concepts into personas. And I'm showing you the user stories first because it's a little bit more digestible. So as a user on a sunlit patio, I want to be able to read the content and see the controls of a web page. This affects a lot of people. Um, as a user in bed with a sleeping spouse, I want to watch a training video in silence so I can get caught up at work. This is a real use case. This is a real thing that happens. In order to click links as a user with no elbow room in coach class with a tiny trackpad, <laughs> so you were all on my flight too, um, I want click areas to be large enough and adequately spaced. As a user distracted by the TV, I want clear headings and labels so that I don't lose my place. This really speaks to my inability to have a good work ethic because I just sit on the couch and watch. Yeah. So um, for what is worth, there are, there are some personas from the book A Web for Everyone. There's a free chapter online, and these personas are free for you to grab. Uh, Sarah Horton and Whitney Quesenberry wrote this, and the personas are great. And they are personas for people with disabilities. And I encourage you to go steal them well, and, and use them wherever you can. I also encourage you to, to look at creating a persona. Mm. Yeah, that is me. Um, maybe this isn't as good an example as I, as I was hoping it to be. Am I doing that? Is that better? Okay, so I'll stand here for a minute and we'll see. Okay, so um, it is not uncommon to be in a situation where the personas, once they're discarded, you're not gonna get them back. But what you can do is you can take the persona that might speak to a particular stakeholder, the, the president, the, the, the client relations person, whatever. Take that persona where they've already identified with it and fold in a trait. And maybe the trait is that person travels, is always on the train. And now you can fold in the fact that there's a mobility impairment. And for another persona, say, this one always works in a cafe in the sun and, and can't always hear because of the noise. And now you fold it in hearing and, and mobility and maybe visual impairments. So don't necessarily try to build these separate discrete personas and user stories. Instead, appeal to the inherent selfishness of your clients and build them into the personas and the things that they do into those personas. I've had, I've had some reasonably good luck with that. Um, mostly because they see themselves and they say, yeah, I understand that. Boy, that is a pain in the ass using a trackpad on a train. This is the part where I look at my watch because I'm terrible at managing time. And I told the timekeeper not to bother because I'm not gonna pay attention anyway. Right? She knows already, yeah, she knows me already. So I'm gonna go through some technical bits. Much of the rest of this is about code stuff. Um, I may dwell on a few bits of it, but the nice thing is all of these samples will be out there for you to look at. Use alt text on images. Please, for the love of God. So this is um, Buffalo Soccer Club. I'm very proud of this. It's an inner city youth soccer program that I uh, co-founded back in Buffalo, New York, where I'm from, by the way. Um, we think it's pretty awesome. I'm not going to bore you too much with it other than the pictures. So this is the page showing, hey, here it is, and here's a happy kid playing soccer. If I turn off the images, though, the kid playing soccer, there's no text behind it at all. It's strictly decorative. The logo up there does have text behind it because that's important. That's the name of the organization. All the other places where there were images that were strictly decorative, there's no alt text behind them. So the, the notion here is to use alt text be smart about where you use the alt text so you're not creating too verbose, too verbose of a page for a screen reader. Can you still make sense of the page without the images? Is any of the content missing? Which is a sign that maybe you have some text set in a graphic. That's a problem. Uh, can you still use the site? And is your alt text useful? There's this wonderful chart. 
yeah, don't worry, you don't have to. But there's this chart that later on you can look at, and it's just a, a way to get you familiar with those steps uh, on how to decide what alt text to use and what is appropriate. Hyperlinks. This is an example of a page that I can never tell what is a link on here. I never know which, one of the, which, which element on this page is a link. Some simple, simple tips for, for hyperlinks, and this is really basic stuff, but incredibly useful. Avoid the click here's, the more, the link to's, the keep reading, etc. Avoid all caps. Uh, maybe don't make a URL a link because a screen reader is going to announce the entire thing. Emoticons are probably worth avoiding, not just because they have cultural cues in, embedded in them, but a lot of screen readers can't announce them anyway. Um, maybe warn people before you open a new window. Uh, maybe inform them that they're going to download something and that it's a 200 meg PDF because I don't know why people do that, but they do. Uh, make sure the links are underlined and obvious. Uh, make sure that if your image is a link that there's alt text behind it that's still valuable and useful. Make sure the link text is consistent. If you're going to keep linking to the same resource like that, that 200 megabyte PDF that you're all suddenly fascinated with, at least every time you link to it and mention, oh yeah, this is that 200 megabyte PDF, you should stop clicking. Use link underlines. Uh, color alone is inadequate. Uh, I have it showing in the, through some different types of color blindness here, but what's most important is that orange is the color for links. Orange is also their call out color. The, hey, look at this thing. So I never know what is a link on, on the Verge site because the same color is used to highlight stuff. Um, you're not Google. I don't care how awesome your site is. I don't care who you think you are. You're not Google. Google can get away with it because everybody understands the, the layout of the search results and we all know what we're getting. Um, they know the, the layout. They're used to it. There's all this lovely stuff in the web content accessibility guidelines that coaches you and what really you need to know is just make sure you leave the link underlines in place for everybody's benefit. Use focus styles. Uh, I am tabbing through the Virgin America page right now. All you can see is that this is updating. I have no idea where I am. This is for anybody who uses a keyboard primarily instead of a mouse. Oh, I must have hit something. I still don't know where I am. Use focus styles whenever possible. Uh, if you remove link underlines, you really need them. Anytime you see focus outline none in the CSS, just delete it. Just deleting that alone makes your website probably a lot more accessible. And it's very simple to test, just use the tab key. Wherever you have a hover style, make sure you have a focus style. Color contrast is important, same page we saw before, um, but this is looking at it through three different types of color blindness. Tritinopia, protonopia, deuteranopia. Um, it's important that there's enough contrast because those colors aren't always going to be discernible on their own. Um, and I have links to all these tools so you can grab those after I've finished talking and you've taken a nap and then you've downloaded my slides. Um, use the label element. Here's an example, really easy to test. If I click that field, the focus should go into that input. I'm sorry, if I click that label, the focus should go into that text input field. It's really simple to do. All you have to do is match the for attribute on the label with the ID on the element that you're pairing it to. That's it. Simple to test. Make sure you do it with um, radio buttons and checkboxes, because if you don't, holy crap, is that going to be difficult. Use HTML5. Great way to be accessible, just use HTML5. Really straightforward. Here's a layout that probably looks familiar to you. Really simple and really basic, but you, will, you probably already know what those elements are on the page. And there are HTML elements that speak to those design elements. We've got the header, which has a role of banner already built in. The navigation, which maybe lives up top for you over on the other side, might live within the header. The main content, the footer, there's a, a search form, uh, an aside, et cetera, those are already built in. Um, here is the responsive version of it. For all values of responsive, that mean narrow viewport, because we know that, yeah. So same thing, it's familiar layout, header, nav, form, uh, the, the role search, the main, aside, footer. Just use the HTML5, you'll, you'll be in a much better much better place. Bear in mind that um, the main, you should only use one of those per page because screen reader users can jump right to the main content of your area and if you have more than one main content area then you don't have a main content 
area. <laughs> uh, use your headings wisely. So this incredibly boring uh, blog post on my site, if you just navigate by headings, those headings show the entire structure of the article. And there are users who navigate by headings and who listen to just the headings of a page to understand the structure. So don't skip levels. Uh, start with H1. Should probably match the title of the page. Just use one H1. Make sure you're nesting them appropriately. Uh, if you've seen anybody who says there's a, that, that the document outline algorithm says you can use all H1s, I'm sorry, that's wrong. Um, it's documented in the HTML specification. It's been written about many times. Don't use an all H1 approach. Every time you use a new section or article, it should get a heading, but it should not be an H1. Um, and if you think it's going to affect your search engine optimization, don't worry about that. Google's, Google refuses to give direct answers, but Google has made it very clear that there is no outline algorithm. Um, using a button versus an anchor versus an input element, we can style them all to look exactly the same way. Really easy to do, right? Yeah, well, don't. Um, consider using the right element for the task at hand. Right off the bat, don't use a div or a span. If you find yourself putting an on click on a div or a span, stop. Think about what you're doing. Cry a little. We'll get through it. If it takes me to another web page address, including an anchor further down the page, use the ahref. If it's taking me, uh, I'm sorry, if it's only doing something on the page, it's not moving me off the page, it's expanding, collapsing, hiding, showing, use a button element. If you're submitting a form, input type submit, I prefer over the button type submit, only because I find that there are fewer style conflicts if people are using the input type submit. Um, there are some, I have a, an article about this that also talks about uh, the key handlers, enter versus space and what the effects of those are. Uh, don't use a tab index of greater than zero. If you have a CAPTCHA on your page, this is just a silly example, as soon as you start tabbing, it jumps right to the CAPTCHA because Google's old CAPTCHA had a tab index. One, two, three, four. I couldn't even get to the skip navigation link because it jumped me right to the bottom of the page. And what's funny is that I filed a bug with the digital gov team and they insisted I was wrong and they could not reproduce the issue because apparently nobody there has a keyboard. <laughs> Funny how you learn that stuff. Um, a tab index of negative one is great if you don't want it to have keyboard focus, but you want to use script to put focus on it at some point, like a close button on a modal, for example. A uh, tab index of zero at least puts it into the focus order. So if you have a div with an on-click and a tab index zero, stop. Go back two slides. But tab indexes of zero is useful for things that do become interactive for whatever reason. Uh, just don't ever do tab index of one or greater. It is worth noting there are places where a tab index zero is very useful. Um, I have seen the, the grid, it's literally just a data table that has either scrolling content or has content that only appears on hover. You may have content on your web page that is in a little scrolly box, for example. A keyboard user can't get into that and make it scroll. So putting a, a tab index of zero on that means that it'll get focus. You can give it a, a role as well if you want. You can give it an ARIA label if you want. But more importantly, giving it that tab index of zero means that a user with just a keyboard can tab into it and then can use the arrow keys to scroll up and down and experience the content that was otherwise missing. Um, please do set the lang attribute on your HTML element. Um, I have a whole talk on this and I talk about all the wonderful benefits for number fields and everything else, but probably the thing that's most valuable to know is that screen readers in particular really, really benefit from this because they will say things the appropriate way. Um, in my other talk, I have, I have the lyrics of uh, Nick Cave songs that I have read out in German and French, and um, they're funnier that way, but we're not going to do that here. <laughs> Uh, source order matters. It's very easy today to uh, blow up the way that we tab through content just by using floats and absolute positioning. Be aware that Flexbox and now Grid can also screw with things. It doesn't mean you've done anything wrong, but just know by tabbing through the page what's going to happen when you start to reorder the content. Definitely don't disable Zoom. Definitely don't do that. Um, otherwise, you'd never know that Bill Murray thinks you're awesome. Enhance. Um, so it's not just for mobile users, but for all users. Just make sure that um, you, you don't ever have a user scalable no. Get rid of that. 
If you're interested in supporting Windows mobile phones, the MS Viewport will help you uh, address that as well. The nice thing is most mobile devices now override the zoom settings, so you can still zoom no matter what happens. Um, avoid infinite scroll wherever possible, he says, thinking about the WordPress themes page. But I use this as an example. Avoid infinite scroll. Uh, it, it makes it impossible to access some of the content on a page, such as the footer or maybe even sidebar links. Um, it ruins the back button. Sharing a URL to a specific place in those results is impossible. You can't just jump into a link and go back and get to where you were. Uh, and less powerful computers and devices and assistive technology will, will just choke, and that's not fun for anybody. Use captions and subtitles wherever possible. Nomorecaptions.com is a great resource for pulling in captions that are auto-generated. Yes, that says, well, so long to his Viagra. <coughs> Don't let Google auto-caption, because they will be terrible. But if you let Google auto-caption, you can use no more captions, pull in all that stuff that's already time-stamped, and fix it, which might involve using the word Viagra a lot more. Remember, though, everybody uses captions and subtitles, um, regardless of the circumstances. Try to include the audio description as well, oh, like he dropped the microphone and everybody laughed, and the speaker identification whenever possible. Um, yeah, more there. Some of you might have heard of ARIA, Accessible Rich Internet Applications. You've probably seen people ask questions about ARIA all the time. Don't stress, unless you're building some really complex, really novel user interface elements, you probably don't need ARIA. Um, the, ARIA has some simple rules. Basically, don't, don't override. HTML already does a lot of great stuff. Don't override it. Um, Maybe don't change the stuff that's there. So don't make a heading into a button. Uh, make sure that they're still usable by the keyboard. Pretty straightforward. You wouldn't want to use ARIA to make something more accessible and then break it for keyboard users. Don't use role presentation or ARIA hidden true on something that needs to get focused because now it just disappears for some users. Um, and remember that all interactive elements must have an accessible name. They must have some piece of text associated with them that says what the control is, ideally what it is and what it does, and in many cases what its current state is, toggled, on, off, blue, angry. So I would mentioned the div with the on click. If you want to make that accessible, you'd have to add the tab index of zero, and then you need to throw on the key press because it has to respond to a keyboard, and then you want to make sure you give it a roll of buttons so that it's announced properly. So what you're doing is you're, you're creating, and this doesn't even include all the code. There's a lot of JavaScript that has to support all the keyboard commands as well. Just to turn a div into a button, when I could just do that. I mean, it really is that simple. Accessibility is not that hard to do. Conveniently, WordPress has decided to uh, go all in on WCAG. I still don't know if that's the way you're supposed to say it, but that's the way I say it. Um, there's this, this uh, lovely announcement from uh, State, of, uh, State of Word 20, 2015. I, I'm, and she's just going to kill me after this. Anyway, uh, what's hilarious about this is there are no transcripts for this video, but you can get in there and, and see him talk about how they are moving forward with this. And we are fortunate enough to have uh, Rian in our audience today. I think this is really, really important. All new or updated code released into WordPress core and bundled themes must conform with WCAG 2.0, 2.0 level AA. That's important because level AA is what people are using when it comes to government, when it comes to lawsuits, when it comes to a lot of businesses' best practices. It has just become the de facto standard. All these great notes on that. I'm going to leave these things with you guys. The accessibility ready tag is a great way to go grab some pre-built themes and not have to stress about the accessibility because it's already there. I think there are 123 as of a few days ago. The nice thing is it keeps growing. Um, yet more notes. Yay. Oh, by the way, Rian won the Heroes of Accessibility Award. I thought that was awesome. Good for you. Absolutely. She should be doing this more than me. <laughs> oh, look, infinite scroll again. Um, there are some plugins already made. Uh, Joe Dolson wrote these three. I have links to them. Uh, I'm going to wrap this up, which will leave me about 12 seconds for questions. 
in a moment. I have three, yeah, but I'm, it's going to take me three minutes just to explain to you. I need 12 seconds. So here, here's the general message that I'm trying to convey to you in addition to just being a selfish git like I am. Uh, supporting accessibility now is going to serve future you. I showed you those stats before about how people accrue disabilities as they age or do dumb things, which they do over time. So supporting accessibility now also helps the injured version of you or the encumbered version of you. By getting younger developers to buy into it now is going to help future you if you are teaching them well. Because you're not always going to be the one who is able to do this, whether it be code it, drive it, make it a requirement, write it into contracts. Start doing it now because in a few years, you're not going to be able to get people to build this stuff that's going to benefit you. So this is sort of future-proofing your life. This is often held up as a wonderful example of how integrating accessibility into design can, can be great and look good and be useful for everybody. This is a death trap. <laughs> this is a death trap for people who like to run upstairs, like me. And this is a death trap for anybody in a wheelchair because the, the, the gradient is too high. The turns end in concrete walls. Um, I imagine there's a pit of alligators off the shot here. <laughs> Is, this, is, this is terrible, so you, you, have to, you have to be careful when you're trying to integrate these things. Don't just try to make it look good, but actually spend a little bit of time. Put somebody in a wheelchair on that ramp, and if they don't die, listen to what feedback they give you. <laughs> Accessibility is not a checklist. You can't just say, we built a ramp, and walk away from it. Further, it's something you have to maintain. So this is a wonderful example of a ramp that goes into a drugstore that a friend of mine couldn't get into because they put the trees on the ramp. They lifted the trees because it snowed and put them on the ramp and he wheeled up there and that's much more polite than what he said in real life. It's not just a checklist. It's also not something you can just do once and walk away from. It's an ongoing process. It's something you have to maintain. And usually the easiest way to maintain it is to not stress about it. Don't overwrite it. Don't build new things into it without understanding their impact. If you've got good headings everywhere, Good, you're in good shape, you probably don't need to stress. So it's not a checklist, it's an ongoing process. Be prepared to internalize that because it will be important. I have all these resources which you can look at on your own. My slides will be available provided I can get good Wi-Fi and I have how long for questions? Two minutes. I won't probably need it. <laughs> so do we have any questions? No, really? View on access keys at all? Whether it's whether they're being phased in or phased out with HTML. Access keys? Yeah. So the general, um, that's a really big question. So I'm going to try and, and really simplify. Access keys are awesome in the right context. The problem is the people who benefit from them are often using tools that intercept those keys and they become very problematic. There is a group of people who feel very strongly that access keys have value. The trick is figuring out how to make sure those access keys are presented in a way that people who use assistive technology can still benefit without breaking the technology they're using. So I think there's value to them. I don't think that they are workable with the current technologies that we have today. Hope that was quick enough. Other questions? There's no way I answered everything. <laughs> is, is everybody asleep? All right. All caps don't do, don't do all caps. Um, that's obviously um, true for lo large blocks of text, right? Because it's difficult for anyone to to read large blocks of all caps text. Mm -hmm. What about, for example, uh, Google Material Designs who recommends all caps for buttons? Uh, all caps for buttons. Yeah, n no. Um, and here's the thing about all caps is a screen reader will typically announce every letter depending on the person the user's uh, verbosity settings so uh, you might put something in all caps and the screen reader is going to say s u b m i t because it thinks it's an acronym or an abbreviation so i always encourage people to avoid all caps in headings you can get away with it stylistically if you're using just css but i still always caution people to avoid all caps 
whenever possible, particularly on user interface controls, because that's where the problem manifests, because it can prevent people from actually completing a task. Yeah. Uh, related to that, do uh, screen readers, do they uh, interpret text transform uppercase too, or? Does the screen reader bases text transform off of how the browser passes it? So um, the short answer is it depends. It depends on the screen reader, the version, the browser, the version of the browser, how the CSS was put in there. So it's not a really simple answer. It's variable. And that's where testing is important. And I've been signaled that I have to shut up. Oh, you didn't say it, but you were very polite about it. Very polite. Okay, that's it. Thank you.